Robert's just mad because he has to edit my stuff. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, th thanks for coming today. I gotta tell you, it's great nice to be back in Georgia and to see a lot of old friends because, uh, you know, I was here for many years until I moved to Washington in 2001 to take a job in the, in the Justice Department. Um, the decision by Judge Vincent on Florida really, it, it, on Monday, really emphasizes the importance of the health care uh, issue. And that's why we're here today talking about medical malpractice reform. Georgia, like a number of other states, has really two big problems. Uh, the first problem is uh, in the healthcare system and the medical malpractice um, system and, and how people recover for injuries and how doctors have to deal with that. And then, frankly, the other big problem you have is the Georgia Supreme Court. Okay. Um, look, there are a lot of legislators here. You all know, and Brenda's gone over, why we passed the tort reform package in 2001. It was a comprehensive attempt to try to fix the state court system at the same time that you reduced frivolous litigation and you did something to reduce health care costs and, frankly, help improve quality of care in the state. I mean, the legislative finding in that particular statute, I don't want to give you a lot of quotes today, but I think it's worth uh, uh, quoting that. I'm paraphrasing it. You know, hospitals and other health care providers in the state are having increasing difficulty in locating liability insurance and when such hospitals and providers are able to locate such insurance, the insurance is extremely costly with a resulting adverse impact on the health and well-being of the citizens of this state. Now, when the Georgia Supreme Court threw out the medical malpractice caps on non-economic damages, um, quite frankly, it did so using very erroneous and wrong legal judgments, and frankly, the opinion itself was quite, I don't know how else to put it, uh, other than deceptive. In fact, I was so astonished when I was researching this particular paper that I, mean, I couldn't believe some of the things I, uh, uh, I ran across. And let, me, let me talk about this. Of course, the case, of course, all of you know is Atlanta uh, oculoplastic surgery versus Nestle hot. And what did they do? They threw out the cap on non-economic damages, which I'm sure all of you know this, but look, there's no limit in Georgia on economic damages. So you know your cost of your medical injuries, your lost income, all your other monetary expenses, there's no limit on that. But the General Assembly made a very uh, good decision on the issue of non-economic damages, which is basically pain and suffering. Okay? The Assembly recognized, you know, those are real injuries. But what is the key difference between them and economic injuries. It's almost impossible to come up with any kind of actual documentary or other proof that shows what those injuries were. So the General Assembly made a reason, very reasonable uh, conclusion that what they should do is allow those damages, but in order to prevent runaway jury verdicts, which, it, which damages the whole system, that it should be limited. And that's why they put the limit in. The Georgia Supreme Court came out and suddenly says, well, no, you can't do that because it interferes with the right to a jury, which is enshrined in the Georgia uh, Constitution. Now, to justify that, they cited two Supreme Court decisions. Okay, the first decision they cited was a case called Dimmick versus Scheidt. And they um, cited it for the assertion that that case said that the determination of damages rests, quote, peculiarly within the province of a jury. Well, the problem with that is that when you actually pull up that case and you read it, the case wasn't about a jury, it was about a judge having added damages on top of what a jury had already decided in that particular case. And the Supreme Court threw that out saying that, look, determining the amount of damages, yeah, that's within the province of a jury and a judge isn't supposed to add on top of it. It didn't say anything about the state legislature modifying or limiting the legal remedy and saying there's only a certain amount of damages you can get for a certain kind of, of injury. Now, the deception actually got worse. They also cited another case, uh, not a medical malpractice case, but a case called uh, Feltner versus Columbia Pictures Television. It's a case about copyrights and movies. 
And they cited that case for this proposition. And they actually put a quote from the case in the Georgia Supreme Court decision. And the quote that they put in, supposedly, from the Feltner case was this. The right to a jury trial includes the right to have a jury determine the amount of damages. Now, if you actually read this in the Georgia Supreme Court decision, they put in three ellipses. You know, that's what, when you're writing a brief, if you leave out language in a quote, you put in three dots, right, to show that you left language out. Well, where did they put the ellipse? They put the ellipse in the amount of dot, dot, dot damages. So they left out something between where it says it's up to a jury to determine the amount of something damages, right? So I pulled the case. Actually, I had one of my interns pull the case. And she came in and showed me the original quote. And I, as I said, I was astonished. Because you know what the original quote says? You know what the word is that they left out? The word they left out is statutory. What the Supreme Court said that it is that it's up to a jury to determine the amount of statutory damages. Now, what was that case about? Well, the case was about the Copyright Act. Columbia Pictures was trying to get, um, I think somebody sued Columbia Pictures. They were trying to get damages under the Copyright Act. And they had elected not to recover their actual damages, but to recover statutory damages. And the Copyright Act says you can get statutory da damages ranging from about $500 to $20,000. And what the Supreme Court said was it's up to the jury to decide what those damages should be within that statutory range. So in fact, um, that's exactly what the Georgia legislature did. In their statute, they set out what the range of damages were. And yeah, a jury is, a, is allowed to determine what the damages should be within that range, exactly like the Columbia Pictures. Case. The reason I was so astonished at this was basically by leaving that word out, they completely changed what the actual holding the case was. Now, I'm licensed to practice law in three different jurisdictions, including Georgia. And the lawyers in the audience here know that if I filed a brief with the Georgia Supreme Court in which I had done this, I would be subject to disciplinary proceedings before the State Bar Association. Because what I was doing was presenting a prior court decision as precedent and citing it for the exact opposite of what it said. I said, I, I just couldn't believe it when I saw this. And to understand how bizarre this reasoning is, under that reasoning, you know, your workers' compensation system in this state is unconstitutional. Well, you know, why is it? Well, you all know the workers' comp systems in Georgia, just like almost every other state, are set up through this administrative system by statute. You set up with exactly what the amounts of damages are. Well, obviously, if you're limiting and setting out what the kind of damages are you can recover if you're injured in your job, well, you're obviously interfering with a jury determining what the damages are. So this should call into question you know, your workers' comp system and the workers' comp system in every other state. Look, at least 19 other states have recognized as constitutional these kind of uh, damage caps. Although I think the Supreme Court's decision said there were only six. So another thing they got wrong. In essence, what the Georgia Supreme Court did is it engaged in judicial nullification. Now you guys have heard of jury nullification, right? Now that's when jurors basically ignore the evidence because they want to come to a conclusion and a finding that is not in accordance with the law. Uh, well, that's what happened here with the Georgia Supreme Court. They engaged in judicial nullification by throwing out a constitutionally valid provision that the Georgia, Assembly, uh, Georgia General Assembly uh, passed. And what's the result of that? Well, I can tell you. It's very clear, and Brenda gave you the number. It's going to drive up the cost of medical care, it's going to limit access to health care providers, and it's going to be a particular problem for those who provide charity care, because for them, medical malpractice insurance can be very expensive. Now, you've only got two options for this, to deal with this. The first is that you amend the Constitution, which is not an easy uh, job in this state, uh, to make it very clear that 
the legislature has the right to limit and modify legal remedies available in the tort system. Uh, by the way, I should mention, you know, the Supreme Court also ignored its prior precedents in which they had, in fact, said that very thing, that the General Assembly has the power to modify legal remedies in the state, which is, you know, accepted law uh, in every state. Um, the second option is what happened in Ohio. Okay, Ohio had exactly the same problem as Georgia. They had a bunch of activist judges on the Supreme Court who literally, in case after case, threw out um, tort reform, including medical malpractice caps, that the state legislature had passed. Uh, all that changed in 2007 when three of those activist judges were defeated and were replaced by more conservative justices who understand that their duty is to interpret the law, not make it. And in 2007, in another case, finally, the, Georgia, the Ohio Supreme Court recognized um, the right of the General Assembly to uh, pass law in this area. Now, I, we have a paper we're handing out that goes into all this in great detail. It also goes into, uh, into great detail uh, over another case that I mentioned. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I do want to at least mention it. Um, two years ago, the Supreme Court made a similarly bad decision, another case uh, called American Home Products versus Ferrari. This was a case involving uh, vaccines, and in that case, the Supreme Court, again unanimously, basically threw out the, this time, federal legislation. They threw out the effects of the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act to allow, a, to allow a tort action to go forward in Georgia courts against um, the, the manufacturer of vaccines. Now, you need to understand something. In the 1980s, vaccine manufacturers in the United States were literally going out of business. Um, there had been something like six companies in the United States that made the measles vaccine, which, as you know, is essential to the health of millions of children in the United States. But tort liability suits were, were basically driving out of it. It had dropped to one company in the United States making the measles vaccine. And why is that? Well, because, look, it doesn't matter how well a vaccine is designed and manufactured, you're always going to have a small number of people have an adverse reaction to it. You know, it saves the lives of millions of people, but you're always going to have an adverse reaction to a small number. So what did Congress do? Congress passed this National Vaccine Act. They set up a special vaccine court. This is administered by, administered by the U.S. Department of Justice. And it works really well. You know, if you're injured by a vaccine, you don't have to show that the vaccine is defective. All you have to show is that the injury you received uh, came from the vaccine, and you get paid by a special trust account set up by the federal government that you know, we as taxpayers all pay for. Their average payout is a million dollars. Okay, it's a lot of money. And they've paid out something like 1,500 claims. But what does it mean? Well, you're not supposed to be able to go to court and make a claim that the vaccine was defectively designed. Because the whole point of this is we get want to protect the vaccine industry while providing compensation for people. Uh, who are injured. And what did the Georgia Supreme Court do? Unlike a number of other courts who all said, no, you know, Congress uh, preempted these state tort suits when they passed this act, they, the Georgia Supreme Court said, well, no, we're just not going to follow that. Go ahead and file your tort action. Now, there's a case currently before the U.S. Supreme Court arising out of another state, exact same issue. And to show you how far out the uh, Georgia Supreme Court is, by the way, the U.S. Justice Department, the Holder Administration, the uh, Holder of Justice Department, they filed a brief in that case, it was recently up for oral arguments, in which they, even the Obama Administration, completely disagreed with the Georgia Supreme Court. Okay? And said that, no, this federal law preempted these kind of state uh, tort actions. Look, here's the bottom line on this. Even if you disagree with the, the urgings of, I think, people on this panel that, look, the best public policy solution to the crisis in uh, medical malpractice uh, claims and reforms is to put caps on non-economic damages. 
if you believe in a rule of law, and in particular if you believe in the separation of powers doctrine, which is not just part of our federal government, but it's part of state government too, where you have a judicial, legislative, and executive branch, then you should agree that what the Georgia Supreme Court did in this case was wrong for this reason. Okay? Whether or not damage caps are a proper, efficient, and fair reform for the healthcare system, that's a public policy question. And it's the legislature that's the branch of government that's given the constitutional authority to make a decision on how to solve these types of public policy problems, not the judiciary. What you have now is an imperial court that is precipitating a crisis in the legal system in Georgia, usurping the power uh, of the state uh, uh, legislature, and basically short-circuiting the public policy decisions that legislators make on these kinds of issues. Uh, they basically set them up as a de facto super legislature that has absolute power to veto what they would think uh, the legislature should not be doing. Look, it's the judiciary's duty to uh, apply and interpret the laws passed by the legislature to deal with these types of issues, not to make up their own laws, not to implement their own particular views of public policy and how such problems should be solved. I mean, quite frankly, if the justices, most of the Georgia Supreme Court want to do that, there's a simple solution for them. They should resign from office and run for the state legislature. <laughs>